Uh, hello everyone, I hope you are doing very well today. Uh, so today is going to be our second lecture in uh, Old English Literature. We talked about, like last time, we talked about the main features for this poem or for the poetry in general in this area. And we talked about uh, the first poem, which is Cademan's Hymn. Yes, okay. So uh, this is like a summary for everything we talked about last time. Now, can you remind me of some of the features that we discussed last time? Please just raise your hand and mention only one feature that we discussed last time. Yes, Riman. Uh, we we talking about that lecture was oral. Uh, oral that's yes, thank not... you, thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you. So it was oral, yes, Rim. And also we talked about that um, the poem itself used to be like narrative and um, yes, so... mainly to tell like a story in a poem in a poet form. Or, Thank you so um, much. Yes, so it was narrative, telling a story in a poetic form. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Aya. Uh, yes, uh, we talked about the collective and personal and religion voices. Thank you so much. Um, Excellent. Yes. Let's see, Razan. Magari. Yes, Razan. Okay, let's see Zahra. Okay, and oh, Razan, uh, then Zahra. We talk yes, about Razan. Among people. Yes, Razan. Uh, we talk about among people of the church that um, uh, they write the poetry. Yes, so we said that uh, monks wrote poetry, so they were selective, right? Okay, yes, let's see that's Zahra. Religion. Yes, they chose what to write about. Yes, Zahra. We talked about unknown people booms and uh, and talked about um, the culture of uh, the Europe countries. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, guys. So, um, just a second. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we are going to talk about, like last time we discussed in details the uh, poem of Cademan's Hymn. And today we are also going to give some more examples of Old English. So some of the poems we will discuss in details and some others we will just like mention them and uh, give a general idea about them. The first one is, or like the second uh, poem that we will study for in Old English is Dior's Lament. Now this is a name of a poem. I want you to look at the name, the word lament. Do you have, do you have any idea what it means? Lament. This is a picture to make it a little bit easy for you. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see Ala, Ala El Jamal. Yes, Ala. What do you think the word lament means? Yes, uh, I guess it means uh, sadness or depression. Good. Um, kind of sadness, yani. Yes, thank you so much. So the word lament means uh, it's like an expression of grief. So if someone, a grief means like sadness or uh, it's a little bit more than saying just like sadness. So uh, lament means an expression of sadness and people usually use uh, use to write laments in order to show uh, th that they have lost something or lost someone. So they would be sad and discussing uh, what they have lost, okay? Guys, please write in the chat for uh, the students who cannot hear me that they should just unmute themselves, then mute themselves again. Uh, no, Rawan. Rawan, lament means an expression of grief, grief, sadness. Now, the word Dior is a name, but here, actually, we don't really know if Dior is the person who wrote the lament, the poet, or the narrator. Now, I want you to pay attention to these two terms. When I say uh, a narrator and a poet, they are different, why? Now, if I, as Naha, I wrote a poem, and this poem is about a young girl who, uh, who talks about her adventures. He, she, is, uh, she goes to the fields and she plays and she wears nice dresses. So 
I am the poet, but the narrator is this young girl who's telling you her story. Does it make sense? So a man can write a story whose narrator is a, is a woman, for example. So the narrator is different from a poet. Now, we don't know in this poem whether Dior is uh, or was the narrator of this poem or the actual poet who talked about this, uh, uh, or whose lament is his. Like, Okay, so now I want to give you, before we get into the line that we are going to study, I want to give you like a context of the poem. So what this poem is really about so that it would be much easier for you to understand the line that we will study. Now, Dior was a person who, or, or the narrator, we don't know, uh, was a person who lost his job. So he was uh, unemployed. Now he was really sad about losing his job. So this is why it's called a lament because uh, it's an expression of grief because he lost something, he lost his job and he became unemployed. In this lament or in this poem, he remembers someone who also went through some hard, uh, some hard situations, but managed to overcome them. Again, it talks about a person who lost his job. So in order to console himself, in order to comfort himself, in order to make himself feel better, he starts remembering or recalling a person who lost something or who uh, was in a hard situation and managed to uh, overcome that hard situation. Guys, please don't open the book while I'm, that I'm talking. Just focus on the slides. Stop looking at the book. Close your books. Okay, so um, again, you understand the context of the poem now, right? Now we will come to uh, the actual line from the poem. This is, you can see it in your book, but I want you to look at the slide. Uh, this is in your book. This is the line from the old English language uh, of the poem. And the translation for this is this. Can someone read it? Can someone read the uh, translate the translation? I will put it between quotes. Let's see, Majd. Yes, Majd. Me, doctor. Majd. Uh, of, of that there was uh, an end, so there uh, may uh, be of this. Thank you so much, Majd. Yes, thank you. Uh, of that there was an end, so there may be of this. Now, I know this might, sound, this might not make much sense for you, but um, I want you to understand it from the context that I just gave you, like the story of the poem itself. Now, we will talk about this the same way we did with the uh, previous poem, Cademan's Hymn. So let's start with uh, what do you notice, the form. We started with the title, of course, and we said that the name suggests that it's a sad song about someone who's expression, his, expressing his grief because he lost something, and Dior is either the narrator or the poet. Look at this. What do you think of the form? What do we have here? What do we have here? Look at these uh, sounds or the letters. Yes, let's see. Um, hala, yes, hala. Hala. Jadali. Okay, it's Arij. Well, from the title, I I, I, I see that the, the, the per, that this poetry is not uh, about war or battles. No, it's about a personal situation that happened to this writer. Good. So it's personal. Yes. Thank you so much, Arij. Let's talk about this gap here. Do you remember what we call it? Yes, Alia. it's Yura. Yes. Let's see, Alia. What do you think, Alia? Uh, I was thinking about the form. There is an alliteration. Good. Where can you show me? Uh, the the P then the P or I don't know if it's in yes. the old English. So uh, should I go with the translated form? No, no, it's okay. When we talk about the form, we usually go for the original one. Yes, you are actually you are correct. 
So thank you so much. We have alliteration. Remember alliteration when we have the same sounds at the beginning of words to create musical patterns. Let's see. Uh, yes, Tasneem, what do you think? Tasneem? Uh, let's see, Riman. You're talking about uh, something that everything uh, will be end and uh, optimistic things, that everything uh, has an end. The and form, uh, this the form, Riman, the form, the form. We started with the form. Also, always walk, like, uh, go step by step. Don't go from one part to another. But you are correct. Okay, Don't the, put the form. Okay, this, think? this. Uh, this talking about something uh, happened in noun? Uh, now, because maybe we have some words here. Okay, Riman, you are correct, but we will come to this in a second. Thank you so much. Let's see. Uh, okay, guys, so let me just give you some uh, hints here. We have the title, as we said, you're the poet. Is he a poet or a narrator? We don't really know. And it's a lament, so it's an expression of grief. Now, the form of the poem, we should just look at the poem. We should see the alliteration here. We should also notice the cesura, as you guys mentioned. And yeah. we should also notice that here, maybe we have, uh, if we want to look at like a repetition of a certain sound, we have the S sound, pass over the, uh, I don't really know how to read it, but in general, like pisses, swa. So you can see here, we have the S sound repeated. Maybe also this is to express grief and sadness. Um, the theme, now we move to the theme. Okay, Riman, now we move to the theme. So what do you think the theme is about? As Arish said, it's not about, a, it's not a love song, it's not about bravery, it's a personal suffering. However, because this is something very important to keep in mind, because we said that He's, he remembers, like in general, he remembers someone who went through some hardship or who went through some uh, bad situations, but managed to uh, break through or to overcome them. This personal suffering that he's talking about is actually mess, mixed with hope. Okay, so personal suffering, but it's mixed with hope. Let's see from this, uh, from the line itself. How do we know? How do we know that? what I'm saying is correct. We have here logic. I want you to pay attention to the meaning now. We have logic. He's saying of that, there was an end. So there may be of this. What does it mean? If that person who went through hardships managed to overcome them and put an end to his struggle, so there may be of this. So I could do the same thing and I can uh, overcome my own struggle and my own personal suffering. Does it make sense? Of that there was an end. It means like if there was an, if he managed to put an end to his suffering, so there may, may be of this. So this so here means that we have logic. He is trying to give us something logical, like a reason, like two parts of the, uh, logic. So uh, if we look at this original language, of course, it's written in Old English, so it's hard to uh, read. And the last thing we will discuss in details here is something a little bit new for you. It's a new word, just a new word for you. It's called binaries. Binaries or binary opposites is something you already know. When two words are opposite to each other, for example, happy and sad, uh, up and down. So these are just like opposites. But because in literature, usually we say we use the term binaries on binary opposites, you should know this term, okay? And we use them to uh, create tension. Now look at this part and at this part. Can you see any binaries? Can you give me any binaries I... or binary opposites? Can I, doctor? Okay, guys, uh, guys, I will just have a second, okay? Just think about it and I will get back to you in a second, okay?
binaries means opposite, okay, in literature. She said, do you notice any binaries or opposite well, <laughs> sorry, opposite words in the um, in this poem or yeah, that was a, that which is already translated in red, you know? Okay, guys, just a second. I'm sorry, uh, because just a second. Can you see my screen, guys? No. Can you see, no, you can no. See my screen? Oh, okay, just a second. Let me see. Refresh. Uh, so, did you find, thank you, did you find any binaries, guys? Can I? Yes, please. Uh, that, we use it for best but this for now mm -hmm. good so we have that and this thank you so much we have binaries in that and this thank you mm -hmm. and there is another one can you see it can i miss yes please a was and b was and maybe yes so was is in the past and maybe is in the present or even in the future. So here is where we can see the hope. So we have that and this, and we have was and maybe. So this is why uh, we have this as like an expression of hope in the poem, okay? Is it clear, guys? I will just go through the notes again so that if there's anything unclear, please tell, let me know. Uh, so, as the name suggests, this seemed to be a sad personal poem. It's not something collective, it's a personal poem. Unlike Cademan, we know nothing about Dior. We said about Cademan, like, yes, he heard the voice of God and blah, blah. But Dior, he's not, we don't know whether he's the, the narrator or not, whether he's a poet. The narrator seems to be uh, an unemployed man who consoles, consoles himself means comforts himself or, himself, or uh, try to make himself feel better by remembering the man who had tough times but later managed to come through. Poetry is a, itself is a consolation as a, the poet keeps repeating the refrain. So he keeps repeating this line from the poem uh, more than once. Okay, guys. Okay, Nervin. Okay, so as just a quick summary, uh, as a quick summary for the poem, as a quick summary, guys, after the end of the lecture, I will tell you how to study this lecture and how to study the whole course in general. This poem talks about a person who lost his job. He is unemployed, okay? In order to make himself feel better, he remembers another person who once was in some hard situations, but managed to overcome these hard situations. Does it make sense? Yes, you have of course. To go again yes. And try to understand it by yourself and like rewatch the lecture in order to try to see if there are any new uh, terms or any new vocabs that you need to know. Okay, so now uh, Doctor, can, yes. can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, the Bilar of the Aki. Okay. Alhina, who are Bihki in no Shaks for the Amalo, in no Tucker Shaks Akhar, in no Tamal Malmina was Tajmanaso, in no Sar Shaks of the Liani. And that's it. I'll sum it. Yes, thank you. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thank you. So we have the repetition of the S sound, as I told you in the original text. We have uh, the gap in the middle of the line, we called it caesura. And uh, we have, of course, the binary opposites between that and was in the first part, and this and may in the second part, of course, that with this and was with may. Uh, and this helps the theme uh, change in the passing of time, as I told you, like he thought, like it was about the past, now it's about the uh, present or about the future in order to show the hope that he's trying to have. 
Uh, and of course, it depends on logic. It means if that person managed to break through or to, um, to overcome his hardship, I will also be able to do the same. Okay. Yes. Okay, guys. Now we will yes. move. Yes. Uh, the line depends on the logic. Does it mean that it's a log it's a factual poem, right? Not fiction. Uh, it does make sense. You are correct. But logic, it can be like either factual or fictional, depending on uh, depending on actually if we know if Dior is an actual person or he's just a narrator, a fictional character in this in the poem. Okay, because if he's a, if he's an actual character, if he's an actual person, yes, it can be a factual story. But he's just we don't know if he's a narrator or a poet. Okay, so let's move to uh, two other poems that we will just study in general. I'm not going to give you um, lines from the poems themselves. We have the wanderer and the seafarer. Now look at these two, these are two separate poems. The word wanderer, not wander with an O to question something, no. Wanderer, when I say uh, a wanderer, it's a person who usually, like when I say I wander, it means that I walk around aimlessly. I walk around without a purpose. So a wanderer is actually a traveler who keeps moving from one place to another without settling down in one place. Again, a wanderer is a person who moves around from one place to another without settling down in one place. And the seafarer is the same thing, but a person who travels by sea. So a seafarer is a person who moves around and travels from one place to another, but by sea, like a sailor, okay? Okay, now uh, these two poems, you should know that they are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, and the thing about these two poems is that they are both called elegies. Elegies. This is another. This is another literary term. An elegy. What does it mean? An elegy. An elegy is like a, a sad poem that the author or the the poet. Sorry, the poet writes when he loses someone. So uh, it's a sad poem that you write in order uh, when you lose a beloved one or even when uh, when like a king or a hero dies. So when someone dies, a beloved one, a hero, a king, they write elegies in order to show their grief and in order to praise everything they did, okay? So we call them elegy. So guys, as I told you before, these are some new words for you. You should just know them. Okay, so both texts are anonymous. We don't know the authors. And the poem, uh, the poems are personal in tone and elegic in theme. So as I told you, they are personal, not collective, because they are talking about the death of a beloved one. So someone died, okay, I'm going to make an elegy about him. And elegic form in theme, Elegic is an adjective of the word elegy. Um, Can I ask you a question? Just a second, just a second. And memory is an important tool here because, of course, they sit, sit around and uh, or they sit aside and like the poet themselves uh, or the narrator, they sit, uh, he sits around and he just keeps remembering the, what this hero or this king or this beloved one did and uh, his life in general. Yes, please, you can ask. Uh, uh, lament uh, is a sad poem. Yeah. Yeah. Is also a sad poem. So how can, how come, both how can I them, understand the difference? Between both of them are sad poems, but that, uh, the lament, I said that it's in general, like when, uh, when you lose something or when you are sad about something. So you are just sad about anything, but elegy, is when someone dies, someone you love dies, and you write about him or her. 
So like, uh, like, he, like a hero or someone you love or a king, you write about their, their death, about their life, about um, their battles, their heroism, okay? So there might, there needs to be someone dying here. Okay, guys, does it make sense? Okay. So yeah. this is uh, all doctor. Yes, please. Uh, like uh, the lament is uh, personal and elegy is uh, uh, general. Um, no, elegies can be personal because we're talking about the death of a beloved one, someone you love. So, for example, a parent, uh, I, I don't know, like a friend, someone dies and you write about him. So this is personal, right? Yes, yeah. the lament. The lament, it could be any, it could be about personal or um, it could be about Both like personal them, yeah. or uh, collective one, don't worry. Yes. Here, for example, yeah. for Dior's lament, he lost his job and he talked about it. So what's collective about this? You see? Okay. So this is for the wanderer and the seafarer. As I told you guys, don't expect yourself to understand 100% in the lecture. You should go back and write down the things and they would be much, much easier for you, okay? And this will continue with you until you are like in your fourth year at university. You don't expect to understand everything during the lecture. Okay, uh, now we will talk about, in general also, about another poem that is called The Dream of the Root. Now, I want you to look at this picture and the word rude. And tell me, what do you think the word rude means? Rude. What do you think, guys? Let's see. Um, let's see, Iman. Or oh, Iman, you are not raising your hand. Uh, Rana, yes, Rana. Uh, hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, rude, it means the cross itself. Yes, the picture. so thank you. The cross or the, uh, like it's something related to Jesus Christ, okay? So the rude means the cross. So from the title, is it a love song or is it about a hero or a battle or what do you think it's about? Yes, um, I want to see new hands, guys. Uh, like, Aya, yes, yes okay. Aya, please. Um, about religion mm -hmm. once. Yes, thank you so much. Of course, it's going to be about religion. Now, I want you to pay attention to the word dream. Now, guys, this is a new technique that people used to um, use to employ or to use in Old English. Now, it's called the dream vision technique. It's a, a very actually interesting technique because uh, it talks about a person who had a dream and he can't, like he, while he was asleep, he had a dream and then he comes and writes a poem about what he saw in his dream. So the dream of the, uh, the, this is called like the dream vision technique. So for example, I will give you an example. Now, if I went to uh, Majd and I told, told her, oh Majd, yesterday I had a dream. Do you want to know what's about, what it is about? And she, Majd would be like, yes, of course, tell me. So I will start narrating the dream. We love to hear about people's dreams and about uh, what crazy things happened in their minds or what, what they dreamt of, okay? So dream here, we're talking about the actual dream that you, like, that you have when you go to sleep, okay? Uh, and even, even in movies, we really like yes. it when, just a second, we really like it when, uh, when we see a scene and then out of nowhere, we, we find out that, oh, it was just a dream. He had a dream and these events are not real. So yes, the dream of the root uses the dream vision technique. Someone going to people and saying, oh guys, I had a dream and I wrote poetry about it. Uh, so this, Dream of the Rood. It's an anonymous text. We don't know who wrote it as well. Uh, and of course, it's a Christian text because the Rood itself means the cross or Jesus Christ. And this text is famous because it uses the dream vision technique. It's just, guys, this is just a, this is the, just a dream, okay? We, it doesn't have to do anything with the Rood itself, with the Christ itself. But you dream of anything, 
Okay. Um, okay. Yes. So does it make sense till now? Someone having a yes. dream. I don't want to go into details because I don't want you to feel it's complicated. Someone having a dream, going to people and telling them about this dream. So here we have someone who dreamed about something religious and he went to people, he wrote poetry about it. He went to people and told them this poetry. Okay? Yes. Does it make okay. sense? Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, Miss. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a controversial one that I want to ask about actually. Um, the dream vision is yes. uh, mainly about someone had a dream and then write or like me as an audience, you know, you. Like, like the audience, you know, after this, I realized that, oh, all of these actions was dream. That's, this is a controversial one. You got me? I think I understood you. These question. days we have here, like, here uh, like the, very yes. famous movies. Uh, I understand your th I understand your point, but um, the thing is that uh, giving you like po uh, the movies as an example is just like to make it clearer for you what I mean by having a dream and then going to people and telling them this dream. So uh, in general, a dream vision is when someone when someone like has a dream and then goes to people and tell them about this dream. Don't make it complicated, guys. It's it's so simple, okay? Okay. okay. So, uh, and th now we will get to like the last, uh, the last two actually um, important poems in the history of old English. Now, this is I'm not gonna read it. This poem is the most important poem. In the, uh, in the history of Old English. Again, this poem is the most important poem in the history of Old English. Like you always connect Old English with this poem. Can someone read the title? Can someone read the title? Beowulf. 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 Beowulf, yes. Now, Beowulf, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like a 3000 line poem. It's a very, very long poem. Uh, and it's, okay, guys, just a second. Okay, so it's a 3,000 word, it's a 3,000 line poem. So it's a very, very long poem. And it talks about a hero called Beowulf. So Beowulf is the name of a hero. Now, this is, a, this is like the whole poem is narrative. It's like, it tells a story. Okay, so uh, this poem describes a person called Beowulf. He's from Sweden. He is called by the king of Denmark because there is a monster attacking them in Denmark. Again, Beowulf is from Sweden. The king of Denmark calls him and tells him, we have a monster and we want you to come and kill it. So Beowulf, goes straight, like he's a hero he's courageous he's uh brave he goes directly to denmark and he kills this hero whose name is grendel actually she's a girl you know this the hero's name the um monster's name is grendel now when beowulf kills grendel her mother comes and attacks beowulf Again, we are talking about Beowulf. Her mother, the monster, comes and attacks Beowulf, but because Beowulf is very strong and he's very brave, he manages to kill both the mother and the daughter. Okay? So, as for now, is it clear? We're just talking about a story. You yes. mean that uh, the mother yes. is yes. Grindel? Yes. Mother of Grindel? The, uh, the name of the daughter, Grendel. Yes. And his mother. Okay. Okay. So. Beowulf is hero in literature. Beowulf is, excuse me. Uh, first hero in literature, Beowulf. 
first hero in literature. He's the most famous one so far. And uh, guys, if you fall in love, you come back again to the same Okay. Uh, so far, he is like in the old English. He is the most famous hero in the old English. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to go on, but okay, guys. So uh, again, as I said, Beowulf is from Sweden. He is called by the king of Denmark to come fight a monster. So Beowulf kills this monster whose name is Grendel. He kills the monster because he's brave and he's strong and he's a hero. And then because he kills Grendel, the monster, the monster's mother, it's a, she's a female. The monster's mother, comes and attacks Beowulf, but Beowulf kills Grendel and kills the mother. Okay, is it clear till now? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So far, good. Now, after now, this is the hero Beowulf that we know. After 50 years, the people of Beowulf, his own country in Sweden, probably get attacked by a dragon. So a dragon attacks the country of Beowulf. And because Beowulf is still strong and still brave, he gets his sword and he fights the dragon and he kills the dragon. However, in this fight, when he fights the dragon, he gets injured. So again, he gets injured and this injury causes Beowulf's death, okay? So he fights the dragon, he kills the dragon, but then he gets injured by the dragon and he is killed, uh, okay? Yeah. Is it clear? So he fights yeah. like a hero and he even dies a hero. He dies a hero because uh, he dies brave, he dies while fighting. So this is why Beowulf is one of the most famous uh, epic poems. We will we call this an epic poem. I will show you the, the writing of the word epic in a second. It's like E E I C. Um, let me just show you guys. Just a second. Epic, E P I C. I will show you the writing in a second. It's Shuman epic. I will tell you. I was a little bit uh, An epic is a long poem, a very, very long poem about battles, about heroes, uh, about wars. So Beowulf is considered uh, to be the most famous epic ever. Uh, because of course, it's like 3000 lines about a hero called Beowulf, okay? Uh, I want you to notice some things. Now, this is the end of the story. He goes to Denmark, he kills the two monsters after 50 years, he kills the dragon and he gets killed uh, or he gets injured and he, he dies a hero. I want you to notice, let's say a few things. First of all, when I said that he is, um, or like he was from Sweden and the king of Denmark called him. So he went to see the king of Denmark and to help him. You can see here how uh, people at that time were from different races, like Britain didn't have that national identity yet. So we had in the, in the, Brit in the English literature itself, Old English, of course, uh, we had different races, we had different nationalities because people didn't have their own national identity yet. And another thing, uh, it, it was easy for people to, or it was very common for people to move around from one country to another. Like he went directly to help the King of Denmark. Uh, so people used to talk about moving and immigration. Immigration means to move from one place to another uh, and all these things. So I just want you to keep this in mind in order to um, link this poem with the context or with the um, with the like the context of the, the the poem sorry with the context of the era that they were in now i want to hear from you how much of this story is facts 
and how much is fiction? Is it a factual story or a factual poem? Or is it a fictional one? Raise your hand. Please. It's a fiction. Raise your hand, please. Yes. Let's see. Uh, Aya, yes, Aya. Uh, of course, fiction. Fiction, why? Yes, fiction. Because the yeah. uh, both is not uh, there is in in this uh, time. There is not hero um ball. Okay, what about the dragons and about the monsters? Are they real? No, they no. are just in so, the stories. I think it's yeah. not real. Not, it's not, not real. True. Some they people, like dragons. Like yes. him because uh, this is a character, it's uh, not real. Yes, thank you so much. The fiction part, guys, is that uh, we have monsters, we have uh we have dragons and these do not really exist in real life i want you to know something like uh some people might say okay maybe there is part of this story or this poem that is fictional and another part that is factual for example maybe there was an actual person an actual hero called beowulf however he did not fight uh, dragons and monsters so there was maybe some people say this. Maybe there was a, a, fact, a factual part related to someone called Beowulf, but the fictional part is related to his uh, to the exaggeration of his heroism, like having a dragon or killing a monster. Okay. But yes, okay. it's mostly, of course, Can uh, I say something? fiction. Yes, please. Yeah, maybe maybe there is a story and there is a man like Bewell, but there is not Dergans and many sisters. Exactly. I mean, yes. I mean, there is man and there is enemies, but the, this enemies is not Dergans. People like yes. us. And maybe. Thank, yes, exactly. This is exactly what these people also say. Now, the theme of this of this poem is. As you know, of course, heroism and bravery and even uh, like resistance because he was fighting enemies. And I want you to know that uh, one detail, I'm not, I didn't, of course, go into the details of the poem. But one detail about the poem is that it talks about uh, loyalty to human being or lo loyalty to humanity. Why? Because uh, this is just one detail that I don't want to. I didn't want to uh, go uh, to go through. Now, before the story, before uh, the King of Denmark calls on Beowulf to help him, the King of Denmark himself once helped the father of Beowulf. Okay, the King of Denmark once before helped the father of Beowulf. So when Be when this King of Denmark called Beowulf to help him with this monster. Uh, it's like he, he is quickly. paying the debt or he is being loyal to the person who helped, who, who once helped his father. Does it make sense? Do you understand it? Yes. So, yes, he once helped uh, the, king of the, the, last point? The, the king of Denmark once helped the father of Beowulf. So now Beowulf yes. is helping the king of Denmark. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's like loyalty to humanity because he is uh, he is loyal to uh, human beings and to people. He's paying the debt of that uh, of the king of Denmark. Okay. Uh, I want to I want to show you. Uh, okay. So here are I don't want it to go in details here, but here are some of the main things we discussed. It's a main heroic anonymous poem. Uh, it's the name of the hero, not the author. It's an anonymous one. We don't know the author. The poem reflects its time and as, described, as it describes invasions, battles, legends, and resistance. This is how we know it is an old English poem. Uh, and of course, it's 3,000 lines of verse uh, in the sixth 
century, but not written. It wasn't written until the eighth century because first we said that the poems were or used to be, uh, okay. yes, they used to be oral, orally, uh, like said from one person to another. And Beowulf is the first hero in English literature, as you guys mentioned. He fights and wins battles to give safety to his people. So this is another theme, sacrifice. He sacrificed himself. Uh, the text is rich and powerful in language, vocabulary, imagery, and of course, uh, all literary devices. Uh, Beowulf is largely fictional. As I told you, we have dragons, we have things. And this is like the story of Beowulf. I don't want to uh, repeat it because of the time. Uh, now I want you to look at this. It's also in your book, but I want you to look at it here in the slides. Uh, this is part of Beowulf's poem. Uh, this is, of course, the old English version, and this is the simplified version. Beloved Beowulf, can someone read it, please? I want a first-year student, guys. If yes. You're a second or a third year? No, please. I want first-year students. Can I? Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, beloved, uh, be beloved, beautiful. Keep well uh, the be bow. Well, yes. Uh, keep well the bow that you swore long ago in the days of your youth, not uh, to allow your uh, glory to diminish as long as you lived. Thank you Dear so much. No, no, these are meanings of words. Don't say them. Okay. Thank you so much. So, beloved Beowulf, keep well the vow that you had that you swore long ago in the days of your youth. It means stay, uh, stay like the brave Beowulf that we know you. Not to allow your glory, your fame, to diminish. To diminish means to uh, get smaller as long as you live. So we notice from this poem that although. Um, Beowulf died, but his glory stayed for thousands of years afterwards. Even now, we know the glory or we talk about the glory of Beowulf. This means, guys, that poetry immortalizes people and things. What does it mean to say poetry immortalizes uh, things or people? It means that it makes them live forever. So if I wrote a poem about Beowulf, this poem after the death, now Beowulf himself will die. However, this poem about Beowulf will make him live forever because people will talk about him and will study his poetry for thousands of years afterwards, okay? So this is like the story, the uh, part of the poem itself. Now, um, of course, it talks about resistance, about uh, like we maybe we as Palestinians, we can benefit from this poem from the part where he talks about uh, fighting enemies. We as Palestinians, we should take this as like a lesson for resistance and a lesson for bravery and fighting enemies. Okay, now the poem has a sad ending. This, you should also know this because he dies at the end. So the ending is very, very sad. Um, and of course, he dies a hero. Beloved Beowulf, keep, this is the thing that I just so, uh, show you, the simplified version of the poem. The death of Beowulf opens the gate for more heroes to follow uh, as Beowulf is succeeded by Wiglaf, who continues the struggle. Now, Wiglaf, in the same story of Beowulf, in the same poem, Wiglaf, is one of uh, Beowulf's kinsmen. He, it means like he's like a knight. You know the meaning of a knight? Knight with a K, it means like a soldier. No. So, yes. Yes, like a fighter. So after Beowulf, the, after Beowulf dies, we have another hero whose name is Wiglaf and who, he continues the struggle. So Beowulf was a hero, he died. And then comes another hero, Wiglaf. Maybe after that he will die and comes another hero and so on, okay? Okay, so, uh, and then uh, Beowulf is mostly myth. Myth means fiction and partly history. 
and its main character uh, is remembered as a hero. He lives a hero, he dies a hero. Central to this poem are themes. We discussed these uh, things like passing of time, like we said, after 50 years, there was another monster, resistance, and what it means to be a human being. Of course, like uh, we discussed these characteristics. Now, uh, okay, do you have any question regarding Beowulf? Do you have any question, guys? Okay, no. now we will get to the last, last work of Old English, and we will just have a general idea, no, no details. Uh, and this is usually compared to, uh, or we usually compare this poem to Beowulf. We said Beowulf was anonymous. This, person, this poem, it's called The Battle of the Malden, is also anonymous. Uh, we said that Beowulf talked about a hero and about battles and about um, all of these heroism things. And this poem also talks about the same thing. However, the difference between the Battle of the Malden and uh, Beowulf is that Beowulf is mostly myth, mostly fiction. But the Battle of the Malden is mostly factual. Okay, so this is the only difference that we need to know. So the poem is anonymous about battles and heroes, but it's more factual. It doesn't have any dragons. It doesn't have any monsters, okay? So it describes a real battle of the Malden. Uh, and of course, it's powerful in language and description. Of course, the actual uh, language of the Old English. Okay, guys. So these are all the poems that we will study regarding Old English. Do you have any questions so far? No. Okay. No. Uh, I will get to the last part. It will not take much time from us. I just want you to know that in the old English, we said that all literature or most literature was uh, verse, written in verse. Verse means poetry. So most literature was written in verse, verse. Poetry. Verse means poetry. Okay? Verse means poetry. The opposite of verse is prose. For example, this is, of course, guys, just an example. This is not old English, but I'm just showing you an example of the difference between poetry and prose. Poetry, just like similar to the ones we saw before, uh, it might have like, uh, here we have lines. It's, it's poetry. It's shared. So we have stanza. We call this like a stanza. We will get to know this term after uh, like uh, maybe like next lecture. So we have stanzas, we have, um, we have lines. Sometimes we might have like uh, a rhyme. You remember the word rhyme? When we say like play and day, when we say uh, put and cut. So these words rhyme. We have rhyme sound. poetry. However, in prose, no. In prose, we just have written documents about things. So it's like you are documenting something in a written form. It's not, uh, it doesn't rhyme. You don't have to think about all the words you were saying. Do you, do you get my point? You don't have to think yes. about like rhyme and stuff. Okay, so here I'm just differentiating between the two uh, things. So for prose, uh, you should know that uh, prose was written in the, Old English mainly uh, about histories and religious uh, and religious. It was it had mostly histories and religious uh, nature. So it either described um, no guys no no poetry guys poetry means shair prose means nether prose means nether. So the this is not shair. This is not shared. This is nothing. Okay. This is just like a paragraph, just like you what you write, like novels, like stories, regular stories. Okay. Okay. So prose. As I said, prose of old English were mainly about either something history or something from the religion. Because who used to write prose? Of course, the monks. People didn't know, regular people didn't know how to read and write. Now, um, 
the most famous historian, historian means a person who writes about history, is uh, Venerable Bede. This is a name of a monk, a name of a monk, Venerable Bede. Uh, of course, he is a monk and he writes about history and about religion, but mostly about history. He wrote something or a book called History of the Old English Church and People. Uh, so this is the name of his book. It wasn't in, uh, it wasn't in verse. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like poetry. It was prose. And it was written in Latin. Do you remember when I said that the Bible was written in Latin? Yes. So this book was written in Latin and was completed in uh, 731. This is the year. And another, uh, another very famous book at that time was called the Anglo-Saxon um, Chronicle. Now, Chronicle means record. It's a record of events. So the Anglo-Saxon, you remember when I told you like the Angles and the Saxons and blah, blah, blah uh, in the first lecture. So <coughs> here, this is another yeah. record of the, uh, the history of England in general. And it was written in prose. Uh, this book tells the history of England from the beginning of Christianity until 1154 with details about battles and invasions, okay? So this is just like another historical book. It's called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Uh, the last thing we will discuss here, we, uh, we just want to talk about two people. One is called King Alfred. King Alfred, he helped to put this book together, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. King Alfred, okay? Uh, his reign, you know the word reign? Reign means the time that he ruled in. So the time that he was a king in. Let me just mute you guys. The time that he was a king in. His reign was a time of great literary production. When he was, when we had King Alfred as a king, we had so many books and so many literary works, so many poets, so much uh, poetry. So, uh, or so many pieces of poetry. So it was a great time for great production. We have another monk called Alfred. Uh, at that time, he was an important writer and translator. And he wrote two very famous uh, works, which are Lives of the Saints. Saint is another, uh, another religious term. It means like Qaddis and Catholic. Uh, homilies. And Alfred is the greatest prose figure in the Old English, and this is a very, very important thing to know. Okay, guys? So I think like this is all what we have for Old English. So far, do you have any questions regarding anything uh, related to Old English? I will talk about how to study the material and how to study this course in a second, but so far, do you have any questions? Okay. No. Yes, <clears throat> yes miss. I yes, have. please. Just for sure. Um, there was a prose in old uh, literature. Okay, but all but just between monks. Yes. Like exactly. people don't know how to write or read it. We don't know if people knew how to uh, like how it was how it was like um, uh, how it was said by people in general, but. Usually, people who wrote the histories and religion, uh, religious books of the Old English were monks because regular people couldn't write. Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay, guys, I will uh, stop the recording now uh, and I will get your questions in a second.